end of their presentation and also hopefully over some wine later, which I'm sure they uh, will look forward to. But thanks very much. Thank Those difficult issues to deal with. 
they often then actually won't come up because if I know the rules say you can't buy yourself a villa in Spain from the family office, then I know not to even go and ask or nobody has to say no to me. So the rules I set down, the rules is maybe a little harsh for some people, maybe some principles as to how we're going to operate and what we're going to do. So for example, shareholder eligibility, who is eligible to take part in this, who's eligible to hold shares and draw in the, or draw income down from the, from the family office. So do we, instead of waiting until there are in-laws involved and we're saying, oh, I like your husband, but I don't like your wife, so we let him in and not her, let's just say, are all in-laws in or are all in-laws out? And let's just set down the rules from the start, then there's no question and no argument. Uh, in terms of children getting involved in the family business, a lot of our clients don't want their children posting on the back of what they've done and thinking, I'm sure I'll just get a job in the family's company and he'll pay me a wage and it'll all be great. Actually set down some criteria to say, if you want to work in the family business, you have to have a certain level of education or professional qualification with somebody encouraging that bit of work ethic and education in the children before they can get involved. And all of these issues are, some of them would be more important to some families than others. They would differ depending on the family uh, and what their own needs are and, and what their focus is on. And once they have an idea of what it is that they're trying to achieve, they need to figure out how they're going to structure this. And probably a lot of our clients may end up with some combination of all of these, but Traditionally, it might have been the trust structure, foundations tend to see more internationally and rather than in Ireland. Uh, a lot of people may have family partnerships and that. What we're kind of tended to see more of nowadays, and particularly because a lot of money is coming from family businesses, maybe an exit to a holding company, um, is using corporate structures as that family investment vehicle, as that family office. Um, and so we kind of tend to lean more towards corporate structures because they are more flexible. I think there's a lot of options you can, you can build into it. They do provide a level of control for the parents who may want to keep that control um, for a period of time. And they can be more tax efficient than say a trust or, or a partnership structure. So in a minute we're going to run through a few case studies that might just in a more interactive way and kind of demonstrate some of what we're, we're talking about. But just to set the scene, some common themes that we're seeing with our clients, those who are still actively within the, the training business and those who maybe had an exit, is there tends to be an over-concentration, particularly in Ireland, in, of wealth in family businesses and in property. And obviously it presents its own challenges um, and if all your wealth is concentrated in this trading business and you haven't diversified out into other, other areas, then you're always at risk that something will happen to disrupt your business, technology, new entrants in the market. So it's trying to talk to clients about, a lot of them will have spent the last 10, 15 years putting everything they have, every minute, every penny they have into building up their business. And now you're talking to them about trying to shift the focus from the, 100% focus on the business to trying to build up your personal balance sheet, trying to take something off the table so that it's not all at risk if something were to go wrong. And also to set yourself up for a future exit so you can get the most value out of that business that you've built up. Another issue we're seeing, and that issue is probably supposed to be a good thing, is longevity. People are also living longer. Um, and a lot of the reliefs around passing assets on to the next generation, retirement relief, business property relief, they're curtailed from the age of 66 onwards. And we're seeing a lot of our clients well into their 60s, into their 70s and beyond who have no interest in retiring from the business. They want to keep working. They don't want to pass the business on. They don't want to give that control. So we think those reliefs are kind of falling behind the realities of life nowadays that actually to be, to be looked to retire and then to out of the business. And finally, <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of clients that uh, almost without fault, our clients all have their biggest debt in their private name, which is usually the mortgage on their family home. And 
and again, all of their wealth and their assets in the corporate structure. And to service that debt, they're drawing down income, paying 52% income tax, and then paying off the mortgage. It's costing them twice as much almost to, to pay off the mortgage. So looking at matching the debt with the assets and trying to more efficiently pay down that debt. And also people who maybe have a business that's worth 20 million sometimes seems a bit mad that they have a mortgage to buy their house when they have all this wealth apparently on paper. So it's about getting that right combination of not impeding the growth of the family business, but starting to take something off the table and starting to, to protect yourself for the future. So we're going to look at a few case studies and they kind of what we're seeing is almost, and none of our clients would call it a family office, we probably don't even call it a family office ourselves when we're, when we're dealing with it, but how these types of structures actually fit in for our clients and how more and more we're seeing them being utilized either alongside the trade, um, in addition to the trade, or after the trade has been sold and then you have this cash box and some of the things that you may be able to do with that. And so, The first case study that I'm going to look at is that original, the first theme that I mentioned there in terms of having all your eggs in the basket. Everything you have is all built up in the family business, it's been your entire focus, and now how do you shift that to start to, to build up your personal balance sheet? So, this is an actual client who we met, obviously, changed their names, but um, they came into meet us and it, it's not uncommon, a lot of our clients would come in to meet us and say, I have this business, it's worth X million, in this case 15 million, uh, it's been really successful, we're hoping down the line somebody's going to come in and write a big check and buy the business off us and, and we're all going to be swimming. Um, and then you say to them, well, what else do you have outside of the business? And they say, well, we have a family home, very relatively modest family home, and that's it. They had nothing else. They didn't need this is probably a bit extreme and you have pensions in place of people that used to have gotten that far. So they had a real simple structure trading company, 50-50 shareholding. So what we were looking at is how are we going to diversify their wealth stream so that everything was not concentrated just in this family business. And then how do we structure them to best get the value out of any future exit that they may have? So holding direct shareholdings 50-50 First thing we did, <coughs> very simple, and we do for uh, we all in the room probably do for a lot of our clients, is to put in a holding company, a holding trading company, very simple. Put 90% of the shares into the holding company, keep 5% personally for John and Mary, and that's that 5% is key to get the entrepreneur's relief of the 10% on the first million on any future disposal. That immediately has diversify them in a way they're going to end up with a certain portion of proceeds in their back pocket, which they can spend, and then end up with some in the whole code. And then there's a myriad of uh, options open to them as to how they use those funds in the whole code. So they're all set up for their exit, but they don't think that's going to come for a few years down the line yet. And a lot of our clients will be sitting like this and not using that holding company structure and maybe as efficiently as they could. So the next step is actually to take it one step further and to say, how can we start to almost operate that holding company as your family investment vehicle now, while you're still also operating the trading business, but starting to take something off the table where it's available just to separate it from the trade and, and reduce the risk to you. So in this scenario, we take dividends up from trade code to hold code, and those dividends come up tax-free. And then you can invest them in whatever you choose to invest in, so share portfolios, property, whatever it is that, that takes your currency. Also, just very simply, building up pension schemes for John and Mary. If everything else were to go wrong, no creditors can go after those pension schemes. Build them up a pot there that's going to be theirs in the end. So if they have an ultimate exit out of this trading company in a few years' time, they'll get a portion of cash in their hands, they get cash and cold co, which will be their family investment vehicle, and then they'll have their pension pots as well. So they're nicely spread out now. They're not they're not as reliant just on the trading company to, to 
look after you in the future. And if that big check comes, then that would be great. If it never comes, then at least they're in a much more comfortable position in terms of, of uh, how they're set up and how they're running, kind of concurrently running a family office and a training business at the same time. And Dara's going to take us through the, the next few case studies that kind of follow on from that. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny, and good, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so, as Jenny said, uh, we're going to have a look at two case studies. The first is, I suppose, where we have an exit and we've had this successful event. So, the champagne court has been popped, we've had an exit. Here, for, I can say we've had an exit at, say, 15 million. Okay? Actually, this is where we find the conversation starts with most of our clients. Clients, once the year four has, has, has ebbed away, they're thinking, okay, I have this 50 million in this company. But interestingly, psychologically, they still don't really tangibly believe that it's theirs. And the question, the first question we get asked is, well, how can I get this money out of my back to college? What can I do with this money? <coughs> so obviously, the first thing one could do is to liquidate the company. For an easy life, a big check is written to revenue. As you know, base cost here we have a 16 and a half million check which is written to revenue. Our first instinct is actually to say to clients, well, actually, let's just let's just hold on. Why do we need this money in our back pocket? What are you actually looking to do with the funds? And typically, I think when you push back, really, clients typically say to us, well, actually, you know what? I want to invest the money, I want to buy the property, I want to go again, I want to buy more shares, I want to buy more companies, etc. I want to uh, do what I've done before, uh, maybe in a slightly different way. So you say, well, look, you can do all of that where you are, you can do all of that with your existing company. So you need to make the date. And how about we just you know, keep your money intact uh, and we simply uh, reinvest? So, we just put together a very, very simple model here which kind of brings this to light, brings it to, shows it in stark reality. If you were to assume a 5% after tax growth rate, you can see here it takes you 10 years to get back the cash that you otherwise would have paid to revenue. So, here in our example, in a personal example, if you start with 33 and a half million, it takes you 10 years of 5% cumulative growth to get back to your 50 million. Whereas if you take our advice, hopefully, and actually, you know what, I don't press the button on that regulation, and I do the same investment strategy, and 5% is, as you know, it's an aggressive strategy. Maybe <coughs> 77.6 million, which is almost 50% higher than in cash wise than what you otherwise would receive. So you can see that uh, the way I always maybe try to explain this to my clients is but really what you're doing here is you're using revenue money, which is called that for a second. They're using revenue money to invest and to make you know, investment growth from. So you can see that the difference between the 27.6 and the 18.5 is really the return on revenue. <coughs> so that's just a very simple example of the, of the gross roll of effect. I think that's often missed in tax planning. Really, what we're trying to do mostly is defer, defer, defer. Because if you can use money that you otherwise would pay in tax, and you can make more than that money, then you're going to be much further ahead than you otherwise would pay in tax. Very sad. So this is just a quick slide to show really that holding companies can invest in the same manner as individuals would. And actually tax investment Investment in holding companies from a pure tax point of view is almost always more efficient than personal investment. Obviously, you start with 52% income tax rate, and you rate below that, you're, you're ahead. If you look at the obviously, if you look at investments in private equity, obviously, we said you can get a 5% share only you can get participation exemption in the future, maybe you have a second liquidity event, etc. Property the group structures is very efficient. Uh, where you fully develop about uh, property, you can get to an effect of 12 and a half percent rate, etc. So really, again, the message is corporates are more effective, even from a, from a, from a 
income perspective and personal and personal. So the next question we get typically is like, okay, that's all very well and good, and the money in the company, and I can see that growth growth effect. But look, how can I how can I use this money? How can I spend this money personally? But again, I think when you push back on clients, actually the, the requirement for personal funds is generally low, depending on the client. So my, as Jim said, so my, one of our clients has a fund which is particularly costly, right? But generally speaking, most of our clients would have other cash outside the group structure, so that they could use that to fund up, you might say, their personal expenditure, their uh, the normal fund on the expenditure, etc. Their main cost, or the main requirement to get cash out of companies is typically for uh, personal property for their private home. Something which is very easy to do and which is quite tax efficient is to actually borrow from the company the funds for the purchase of the private home and the redevelopment of the existing home. Because there's two pieces to watch there. Firstly, there's a benefit in kind. The benefit in kind on, purchase, on loans to, for private residences is actually at a very low 4% rate. So if you think about a 50% income tax rate, effectively this is a 2% interest cost so that you're not paying interest to a bank, you're paying interest essentially to revenue in terms of the, the BIK. There's also this close company deposit, which is 25% of the fund of the loan. So here in a simple example, the fund at 4 million private residents, we um, take essentially cash-wise 5 million out of the company, 1 million goes to revenue, 4 million goes to John, and John uses that 4 million to fund the purchase of the BIK is essentially a 2% interest cost on the form Rather than, again, again this, is, this is kind of a quasi-deferral, <coughs> this deposit which is paid to me is ultimately refundable to John as and when he, he repays that loan to the company. And that's not time bound either. And interest, interestingly, John, the extent of John already has a private home, which we expect to be or she would. Uh, that private home can be sold, and those proceeds are obviously tax free. Those proceeds can themselves be used to obviously for the personal expenditure. So, it's an interesting way to actually facilitate the extraction of cash and uh, effectively a low cost, a 25% deposit, and a 2% growing interest cost. Something which is very easy to do and very effective. So another common theme that we would come across would be, well, okay, this is a family office, but how can I use the money in this company, in this family office? How can I use it to benefit my family? I think there's just two broad pieces of this. And when, you tease this when we tease this out with our clients, really, clients typically are very, you might say, are very slow to actually give value to their children while they're alive. I think that's probably because the type of clients we can deal with have essentially earned, earned funds themselves, actually worked very hard to these businesses up and have not themselves inherited that value. So they really have a strong work ethic and they have a sense that look, if I were to give value, uh, give cash to my children, I'm not sure that would be best for them in terms of their personal development, in terms of encouraging them to work hard, etc. So typically they prefer to give you might say a Lego rather than a handout. This is something which we would not necessarily advise our clients to do, but to the extent that clients wanted to support, support their children and take cash out and gift it, you can see that the effective tax rate is very, very high. So we have a distribution and a 52% income tax hit, and then we have a subsequent gift and a percent CAT hit. So to fund 1 million into the child's startup company, John's daughter here, has cost us 3 million of company funds, which is not very efficient. And again, to my commercial point, it doesn't really align with our client's objective, which is, again, to give a leg up rather than a handout and to incentivize the sector. So a very simple alternative that <coughs> clients typically love is, uh, rather than taking 3 million to fund 1 million of uh, funds into the startup company, why don't I kind of 
why doesn't my family in office act as effectively a quasi bank to this uh, new venture? So I would, my family office, my holding company, will invest into that company. Will it just, here we have an investment by reference to that preferred share, which will uh, have a desired return, etc. So from the daughter's perspective, she's, she has the ability to grow that startup company. And importantly, any value which is created over and above one million will accrue to the daughter. But all the value up to one million and up to the return of the preferred share accrues back to the family office. And this is also very, very important because typically, uh, to the extent that there's more than one child, obviously uh, it's important from a family office perspective, which I mentioned earlier in the context of the family charter, that we try and treat everyone equally, so to speak. So here the family office is getting the return and the preferred share, and the daughter's getting the opportunity, which is uh, emphasizing the opportunity to grow that pot to his or her own benefit. The clients typically love this structure and it just happens to be as a much more tax efficient, which is, which is helpful. So the next slide is just a typical estate freezing um, plan, which most people in this room have seen many times over. And really this just deals with the, the is issue whereby the family office is growing in value which is a good problem, so to speak. Uh, and our clients would typically ask as well, okay, what can I do to mitigate the uh, inheritance tax credit? So the first thing we do is let's stop the clock, right? Let's make sure any value created from here and after, <coughs> within, I might say, within the inheritance tax credit. Companies are very effective for this because obviously the share classes, etc., we can ensure that the control is still, be, is still retained by the parents. Typically, parents, even though their children may themselves be uh, in the 40s, in their 50s even, are still minded to make sure that they don't control over what happens in the future. And, and in, interestingly, that's generally not because they don't trust their children, it's because they don't trust necessarily the people uh, who might surround themselves around the children. So it might be spouses, might be hangers-on, etc. Okay? So typically they're concerned to the extent that they pass value to their children, which the children can, can control, that that will, uh, that will come a proper in one way or another. Again, you know, so another conversation for another day with scientists, but ultimately you might have to relinquish that control at some stage, and if so, when should that be? So the next question we often get asked is, well, okay, that's all very well and good, but what's the long-term plan here? I keep building, building all this value in the company, what should one do, what should I do? And really there's no answer to this, it all depends on the client. And so kind of a rolling issue as well, because people's needs, people's, people's views change over time, etc. So ultimately there's, there's probably three buckets of plans and probably more even. The first one is that you can always liquidate to the extent that you need to get the funds into your own name. And again, you can say, well, why do you need to do that? If values fell for argument's sake, it might be an idea to liquidate. If capital gains tax rates fell, again, there might be another reason why it won't liquidate. And again, that option is always on the table. The second one, which we, which we chiefly refer to here as retiring to the sun, is always an option. And interestingly, clients actually mostly come to us and Probably the typical bar stool uh, tax advice that one receives from the call. If they typically come to us and say, Oh, I want to move to Portugal, I heard Portugal is absolutely fantastic, they have a great sun tan, blah, blah, blah. So our first instinct is actually to say to them, Hold on, do you want to move to Portugal? Why do you want to move to Portugal? If they want to you know, increase their golf, improve their golf handicap, that's fine, do you know, that's a golf, etc. But our first instinct is actually to say, No, that is an option, but an option that which you'd only pursue to the extent that you want to ultimately uh, do that and the lines with your life uh, style or, or broader uh, goals, etc. Spending four years, three to four years in a Portuguese golden prison is not an idea of the phone that's going to lead to that clients. And the last option I think is just do nothing. And when we do nothing at all, we'll have to ultimately die, unfortunately. 
and on that the there's obviously no common gains has and so that obviously we need to consider the CAT implications and how that would be treated in the real, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to move on to the last of our three case studies. <coughs> This is probably a variation of the, this again is another larger case, names have been changed to text, persons. Um, another larger case, and it's almost a variation of the, the two before. It's a case which, does, which is a second generation business, and they're actually hoping to pass that business on to the third generation. So something which has never happened to me before in my, uh, in my career in tax is that the clients came to me and said, I have a problem. And he said, the problem is we have too much cash. And I said, immediately you've come to the right place. <laughs> we can sort it out here. But in all seriousness, this was in actually keeping the mother here up at night. And it was called keeping her up at night for probably two slash three, probably more reasons. What did she do in counting it? <laughs> <laughs> the first problem she has, the bank wanted to charge her for the key cash uh, it, which wasn't great. Uh, so, so there are a few problems here and these were actually really like business problems. She said, well, from a commercial perspective, um, all our employees, employees can read our accounts and we know we have all this cash. Right? So if they're coming knocking any second day looking for pay, pay, pay increases, we're telling them we're paying you more than the guy down the road and they're saying, like, you know, we're making all this money and I should be making more. Secondly, obviously the company had third party debt, so therefore it, at any time if the business didn't do as well as it should be doing, this cash was actually at risk of creditors, creditors etc. Uh, thirdly, suppliers were beating them over the head for margins because they could see them making all this money. So these are all massive headaches. And lastly, probably least importantly, business relief. She was concerned that in the event she would die, obviously. <coughs> such a large proportion of cash to the total business that there would be significant inheritance tax bill. And she was worried that the business would have to be sold, etc., etc., and the uh, case would be numbered with this big tax bill, and the whole thing, the whole house of cards would come crumbling down. So ironically, this massive success story for a small family turned into actually a bit of a nightmare with all this cash. So we, saw, we obviously saw the cash as, you might say, an opportunity rather than a problem. And so what we, what we did was we said, well, you know, what you should be doing is actually making sure that your business is being run efficiently and effectively. And we should try to take that cash off the balance sheet, obviously that giving rise to a large tax bill. So we ended up with this structure. As you can see, it's essentially a, a trading business structure and what we refer to tonight as family office structure. So the trading business structure on the left hand side is essentially the same trading companies that we had previously but just absent the cash which was a bit of a millstone around our neck. And obviously we left a bit of cash behind because of the working capital and the requirement etc. to any business needs a healthy amount of cash. So we didn't want to, we didn't want to uh, Give another problem with taking our cash off the balance sheet. But importantly, in terms of trading company structure, that's now fully qualified for business relief, and therefore, in the event of the parent's death, this death is not even if this baby is parents rightly seven year old, um, in the event of her death, um, the very low level of a um, very low level of CATs be paid, uh, and that's, that's On the investment, on the right hand side of the investment company structure, we have the so called family office. And importantly, the companies here are unlimited and therefore are no longer subject to disclosure, and therefore there will be no crying eyes in the context of what happens this well, etc. And they will mostly disappear from public view, although there's some limited files to be done, etc. So, what we started to do is actually have a conversation with them about this cash because previously, ironically, they didn't really view the cash as belonging to them. 
So we're having a conversation about, well, actually, what do you guys want to do in terms of your family, family office structure? What do you, what is, what are the options available to you in respect of this cash? Do you want to double down on what you put out and invest in other new businesses? Do you want to um, acquire other business development assets, so to speak? Or do you want to actually use the cash to, you know, to do the things that you might want to do personally? Going back to our example of a family home, you want to borrow from the company to, to you know, buy yourself a family home, or even to repay existing mortgage debt that we have to have. Ironically, one of these, George, John George and Mingo, one of them actually had a, had a significant mortgage, and they were actually worried every month trying to make bank repayments. Even though they were vast and well known, <coughs> this is the type of, like, you might say, uh, kind of almost uh, muddled thinking that people go through when they put things in, into certain boxes. <coughs> Our job is trying to unpick those boxes and make sense of that for them and to allow them to utilize the cash that they already have um, to measure. So I won't go through this slide, I'll just finish on this last slide, which I think is another important one. And this is this is related to that previous case study, but this is a generally widespread application. We often come across situations where we have common shareholders in holding companies which have a lot of cash, and again, they're a bit, you might say, they're a bit twixt in between because they might have been partners in that business which had a very successful business. On the one hand, we don't want to actually they don't want to loan a company off and pay loan a capital gains tax. Uh, on the other hand, from a business perspective, they don't necessarily want it to be handed off either on a go forward basis. So this structure actually facilitates that nicely in the sense that here we have two guys, George and Ringo, they've had an investment. The, the investment, they've had an interest, there's a load of cash in the company, and rather than liquidating the company and paying on a capital gains tax, they set up their own separate, you might say, mini family offices. So company A is George's family office, and company B is Ringo's family office. And now they can separate to each other, they can decide what they want to do with their respective um, companies. And their respective companies will get, a, effectively, an equity investment into, uh, from their existing cash box company. Again, this means that, to Jerry's point, we avoid disagreements and conflict because George might want to go and invest in Venezuelan equities, and people might want to invest in German government bonds. They can take their own, uh, proceed on their own strategies uh, independent of the world. So we leave it at that. What we try to do is maybe give you a flavor of what we think of family offices in an Irish context, and also maybe just walk through some of the real life examples that we come across in practice. On our commercial ends. Happy to take questions now, as Ronnie said, and I'm going to ask you 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 to ask there's no stamp duty on the liquidation. Uh, otherwise, you're into obviously an acquisition. Potentially, if you had funds, you could essentially buy the property out and obviously pay stamp then. Otherwise, just the distribution in space would be a normal distribution. You also have to value the property, etc., uh, which would be uh, efficient.
I've never done it. I'll have to see how that goes. Say it turns off. Sorry.